so we got two minutes or so. Let me, I'll do, I'll do a little bit of uh, Twilight World. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the service will begin in three minutes.
Welcome. I'm Bowie Sewell, and Dick Lamb was my friend. I am honored to introduce the governor of Colorado, Jared Polis. Hello, everyone. Uh, I wish that as friends and family members, former colleagues of Governor Lamb, we could gather under happier circumstances, but we gather under the circumstances of celebrating the life of a remarkable man, the memory of Governor Richard Lamb. I want to express condolences on behalf of the state to Governor Lamb's family, express appreciation for uh, being able to speak on behalf of the grateful state of Colorado today. His wife, Dottie, who I've known for many years, his children, Scott Hunter Lamb and Heather Susan Lamb, and his grandchildren, who I got to meet, uh, are here as well. You know, when I was inaugurated in January of 2019, uh, I was proud to have, as, as is tradition, every living governor of Colorado present. We had a very special time together in the governor's office uh, before taking the oath of office. And I was honored that, of course, that very special time included some words of wisdom from Governor Lamb. His career is truly one for the ages. When I think about the life he lived, how he spent his time, both as governor and thereafter, the word that comes to mind is service. Because whether or not you agreed or disagreed with Dick on any given issue, no one can deny that he lived a full life and one that was truly dedicated to serving others, whether it meant the people of Colorado or his students or his family. He served his country in the Army. He served clients as an accountant and lawyer. He served students as a professor. And of course, he served the state as a legislator, as a governor. Along the way, Dick never stopped exploring new frontiers and trying new things and challenging the way people thought about things. During his first campaign for governor, Dick walked across the entire state to meet Coloradans in their own community. Even more impressive, while he was in office as the longest serving governor, which by the way, no future governor, including me, can ever break that record because it's in our state constitution term limits now. Uh, he met Coloradans in their own communities and co-authored and authored five books, including a novel about a fictional governor from Texas, probably based on, on his own experience, as well as a book of poetry about the American West. Uh, it's probably not an exaggeration to say that Dick wrote more books than many other governors of Colorado have read. <laughs> Dick never shied away from the issues that he cared about. He challenged himself and others to find a better path forward, his passion for the environment for the quality of life in Colorado uh, was really prescient. And in many ways, the life he lived and actions he took have helped assure us the great quality of life that we enjoy in Colorado today. You know, moral philosopher and novelist Leo Tolstoy said, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. As a free thinker, Dick was the quintessential exception to the rule. Throughout the years, he gave himself permission to evolve, to adapt, showing the mark of genuine leadership. The governor that came into office in 1974 was different than the one who left in 1987 uh, and different than the professor known to many of his students at DU. We're all informed by our life experiences and the rich life experiences of Governor Lamb really helped inform his future and ours. Beyond all of his achievements, beyond the many titles he acquired throughout his career. It was the titles in his personal life that gave him the greatest joy. Husband to Dottie, father, grandfather, traveler, voracious reader, author, outdoorsman, so many others. And when he passed, Governor Lamb was surrounded by his loved ones. And as a state, we mourn, but we also celebrate the incredible life that he lived. You know, 
I'm sure when Dick Land was governor, he himself signed many proclamations. It's one of the things that governors do. And we prepared a proclamation that I'm presenting to the family that declares this Governor Dick Lamb Day and has some wonderful, thoughtful uh, verbiage in celebration of his life. As we celebrate uh, the life of times of Dick Lamb today, for many of us, it's also about a celebration of the Colorado that we love and the contributions that Richard Lamb made as a citizen and as a governor and who, as somebody, inspired a whole new generation of leaders that will make their footprints known in our state for decades to come. Thank you. Governor Polis, thank you on behalf of all of us and the family for your presence here. I said Dick Lamb was my friend, but more importantly, he was Colorado's friend. I would say the best friend that this state ever had. Dick Lamb was a teacher, and I had the privilege of teaching with him. He did politics as a pedagogical activity. When I moved here 50 years ago, Actually, tomorrow will be 50 years to the day. He invited me to be a part of a little group that talked about his campaign for governor. And I pointed out at some point, I didn't see how the hell we could win the governor's race. And he said, Bowie, if we change the tenor of the public debate in Colorado, we will have won. The votes will take care of themselves. He won, and Colorado's public life was never to be the same again. He put together quite a gang, many of whom are here, and he took such inordinate pride in holding up the people who chose to work for him. Many are here though we are long in the tooth, but some are not. Along the long road of public life, Howard Gelt, Hugh Humphreys, Larry Miller, Sue O'Brien, Jim Monahan, John Parr, Tom McCoy, and a few others have passed on Dick Lamb always showed up at their memorial services. And he brought with him usually a crumpled piece of paper and he would read the words of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry from Wind, Sand, and Stars. Nothing can match the treasure of common memories of trials endured together, of quarrels and reconciliations and generous emotions. It is idle having planted an acorn in the morning to expect that afternoon to sit in the shade of the oak. Nothing in truth can ever replace a lost companion. Old comrades cannot be manufactured there is nothing, nothing that can equal the treasure of so many shared memories, so many bad times endured together, so many quarrels and reconciliations, heartfelt impulses, friendships like that cannot be reconstructed. If you plant an oak, you will hope in vain to sit soon under its shade for such is life. We grow rich as we plant through the early years, but then come the years when time undoes our work and cuts down our trees. One by one, our comrades deprive us of their shade. 
And within our mourning, we always feel now the sacred grief of growing old. If I search among my memories for those whose taste is lasting, if I write the balance sheet of the moments that truly counted, I surely find that no fortune could have bought me this. You cannot buy a friendship of a companion bound to you forever by ordeals endured together. I am pleased to pre present one of the dear friends of Dick Lamb and his family, our former mayor, Wellington Webb. Governor Polis, Dottie, Heather, Scott, dignitaries, families, and friends, Dottie, I just would restate the obvious. Dick really loved you so much, there was nothing that he would not do for you and his kids. I want to thank you, Dottie, as well, for providing me with the honor to speak today at this memorial. This memorial service for my friend Dick Lamb. Dottie, my condolences are from me and also from Wilma. She would have been here today if not for her recuperating from hip replacement surgery. She also would have had a role since she was instrumental in connecting me and Dick together. You see, I was expecting a call from Dick Lamb as I'd been given a heads up by Ruben Valdez. And the phone rang, Wilma picked up the phone and said, Dick, how are you doing? And this and that, and said, Wellington, Dick Lamb's on the phone. And Dick asked me about joining his cabinet. And he said, can you give me a number between one and 10? And now all of you know how fast Dick talks. And I said, six. And then uh, we spoke for a few more minutes and I hung up. I'd been working at HEW and Carter was out, and Reagan was in, and then Wilma said, where are you working? I didn't know you had a job. I called Dick back and said I was up to an eight. <laughs> All in the same hour. <laughs> but as I look around this assembly, only Dick Lamb could have gotten this many people in a crowd together. Some of you have had battles in the past and didn't even care for each other, but you all cared about Dick Lamb. And that's why you're here today, because we all care about Dick Lamb. And Dottie, how ironic it is that I walked out on Dick's first inauguration for lack of diversity in the cabinet. Now, through years of our friendship and respect, I'm given the eulogy. The last time Dick and I spoke, we were at Syrup. And I, could, I saw two individuals talking with their kids. There's a former governor and former mayor. They were really talking about some big politics. It must be something real important. Well, the conversation was really about what old men do. How long does it take you to get to the bathroom? Uh, and how often do you have to go in the evening? <laughs> and uh, that conversation took much longer than I thought because we both had to take a break to go to the restroom while we were at Syrup. Dick Lamb was born August 3rd, 1935, and passed on July 29th, 2021. But if you look at most funerals, most monuments, there's always born and passed. But what's really important is the dash in the middle. The dash is where the life is. The dash is what life is about. And the dash is 
really about Dick Lamb's life. Molded in Madison, Pittsburgh, and Berkeley before coming to Colorado. He was a member of the greatest generation of political leadership in Colorado. Pat Schroeder, 1st Congressional District. Tim Worth, 2nd Congressional District. Gary Hart, United States Senator. And Dick Lamb, Governor of Colorado. A glorious age for Colorado politics. Dick was truly Colorado. Independent, tough, strong, complicated, unpredictable, kind-hearted. Dottie, you know this as well as some. Oftentimes, he would do little private things to help people along and wouldn't want anybody to know about it, of people he helped along the way. I know he called Wilma and I when we were having issues with our son, and I know others that he called as well. He also was a futurist prophet. Much of what he spoke about and talked about, I think we've lived to see. We often talk about the amount of traffic we were going to see between Cheyenne and Colorado Springs. And I think we've lived to see that. Like JFK when he said the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans, what JFK did for the United States and for this country, Dick Lamb did for Colorado by assembling what I consider to be the greatest staff and cabinet Colorado has ever known to work on behalf of this great state. I remember those cabinet meetings and retreats as pure intellectual verbal combat of ideas, thoughts, and issues of the day. And we all have our own special memories of our relationship with Dick Lamb. And I'll share just three of those very quickly. Because I always try to find some humor in some of these issues as they come up. And some are not humorous. So I'll start with a couple of humorous ones first. Oil embargo. Some of you may remember how Dick would go around the circle to see who was driving what car. He was concerned about us burning too much gasoline. And then he asked us after we got to the mansion, Governor Polis, did we drive to the mansion or did we walk? Because he was interested in preserving energy. And at that time, Wilma and I only had one car, so she had her one spot on the circle in which we both used that same space. And so before Dick could call on me, I had to remind him that Wilma and I only had one car and that Cadillac on the drive did not belong to me. That belonged to someone I knew that drove a Cadillac that was renting that space. The second one, we also know Dick was an anti-discrimination lawyer and he takes everything so serious. So Eric, I don't remember if you were at the retreat when we went up to near Allen's Park. It seemed like White Horse something or another and that was, we were there and so Reuben and I were, room, Reuben and I were roommates. And we kidded each other and said, now how is it the two minorities ended up in the same room? So we decided to broach that in the cabinet meeting with the governor, in which we knew he would have a psychological breakdown trying to figure that out, <laughs> since he had nothing to do with it. And we raised it, and then he looked at Bob Turner as if he was going to wring his neck. And we says, Governor, it's OK. Valdez is V and Webb is W, so it's all right. The last issue was the Passenger Tramway Board, in which our good friend to me and to, that I had the luck of hiring, and to many of you, Jennifer Moulton, was the chair of the tra Passenger Tramway Board. Many of you remember the ski lift accident that took place, in which two people were killed and several were injured. Well, I called after. Jennifer had shared, passenger tramway said we should shut the ski lifts down. And Dick's first response was, all of them? And I said, no, we're just going to shut the one down where the accident occurred. And he did that and took the heat for what it, and took the heat for it. So when I think back about Dick Lamb, 
I thank God that you gave us Dick Lamb for this brief moment on history's time clock. A moment of time on a clock to spend time with us continuing to challenge our ideas, our thoughts, our philosophies about the world we live in and challenging us to make it a better place. Husband, grandfather, father. But more than that, borrowing from, borrowing from a poem that I changed the words to because I think it fits so apropos. And I'll close with this. Environmentalists, let the word go out. The protector of our outdoors is gone. Reproduction rights clinics, let the word go forth. Stop the clocks. Our leader has passed on. Students, let the word go forth. Place crepe boughs around the Dove's offices because the office hours are no more. And to those who worry about population growth, health care, cost, and climate change, bring out the coffin. Let the mourners come. You see, for many of us, the friends of Dick Lamb, he was our north, he was our south. He was our east and our west. He was our moon and our midnight. Pack up the moon and dismantle the sun. Let the Lord know Dick Lamb is coming. The 14ers are too low. His earthly presence is heaven bound to watch over his beloved state, Colorado. For eight of the 12 years that Dick Lamb served as our governor, his lieutenant governor was Nancy Dick. And she has been kind enough to send these words for today. Serving as the first woman lieutenant governor of the state of Colorado under Dick Lamb for two terms was the highlight of my political career. He brought an inclusive view of governing something that had been missing in many previous administrations. It became one of the many wonderful precedents our administration bequeathed to our state. Dick was an iconoclastic governor who left an impressive legacy of lasting policies. He clearly was the right man at the right time, and Colorado was so fortunate to have him step forward. His innovative, rebellious, brutally honest, and insightful voice will be so deeply missed. Nancy Dick. May I introduce a member of the Lamb Cabinet, president of the Colorado Forum, who had a career in Colorado politics, she said, because Dick Lamb believed in me, Gail Shetler. And thank you, Wellington, for such a warm description of Dick Lamb's life and your relationship with him. Dick meant the world to me, as I know he did to you and to you, Bowie, and to so many of us in this room. I grew up on a cattle ranch near the tiny town of Shandon, California, population 500. My high school graduating class was 17. Never did it occur to me that a girl like me could have a career, much less become a leader. It just wasn't something girls or women in my generation could aspire to. But it was Governor Lamb who told me I could do both. I moved to Colorado in time to vote for Dick Lamb three times. Unlike you, Wellington, the day before his third election as governor, I was totally shocked 
that he asked me to serve in his cabinet. I was a school board member, but I had never run anything. Certainly not a large organization, and I had no idea what to do. But Dick believed in me. He coached me, and even when I took risks or made some really bad decisions, he backed me privately and publicly. Many of us in this room had that same experience with Dick, empowered to do our jobs because he believed in us and encouraged us to try new ways of doing things and was always there to back us up when we needed it. I believe this was one of Dick's greatest contributions as governor, finding and building the next generation of Colorado political, business, and community leaders. Eric Sonderman, another close friend of the Lamb family, said the same thing in a recent column, which he kindly sent to me. It is an incredible legacy. Dick loved debates and ideas, particularly ideas he hadn't thought of before. When he heard a new idea, he would get this little smile on his face, delighted with something new to think about. I well remember my first cabinet meeting when Dick threw one of his verbal bombs into the crowd of us sitting around his office. He sat back and relished the roaring arguments and ideas that flowed around him. He never thought that he alone had all the wisdom and the answers. He really wanted to know what everyone else thought. And so I learned from him to respect people who were different from me and had opinions I didn't agree with. One way Dick showed how much he valued people was to remember their names. He remembered everyone's name, even if he hadn't seen them in years. And I recall a meeting I went to with him in Pueblo. After his speech, when someone in the crowd raised her hand to ask a question, he called on her by name. She was just thrilled. People loved him for caring enough about them to remember their names. What a gift. Dick filled his administration with smart, talented young people. He loved mentoring his staff, just as he also later loved mentoring his students. And over his years as a professor, we would have lunch several times a year, talking about what he was teaching, what he was thinking, and arguing about what I thought were some of his more outlandish ideas. I learned to come prepared with data and facts. He would call me periodically to tell me about a remarkable young woman in one of his classes and ask me to spend time with her. I always felt so honored that Dick Lamb would ask me to do that. Now, I have something to say to you, Dottie. This was never just about Dick Lamb. For all of us in your orbit, it was always Dick and Dottie. Dick had the position and power of the governor's office. You showed us how to use our positions to be powerful too, to be forceful advocates for what we believed, always to stand up for women, to actually challenge and change the status quo. You did that as First Lady, and you've continued to do that over all the years since. Dick was my mentor and friend who gave me the opportunity to lead. You were my guide and my inspiration as I learned to lead. I am forever grateful to you both for taking a chance on me. I'm pleased to introduce the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains, she moved to Denver in 1975 to obtain a degree from the Colorado School of Mines and stayed in Colorado, she says, quote, in large part due to the favorable environment created by Governor Lamb's three terms. Ms. Vicki Coward. Dottie, when you asked me to be part of this service for Dick, I was deeply honored. And I also struggled a bit with the desire to honor him 
particularly for the difference he made for patients that Planned Parenthood serves and all the challenges they have while not being too political. But my friend Gail Shetler wisely counseled me, be political, it's what Dick would do. So, let me remind you that abortion was criminalized by the Colorado Territory's first legislature in 1861, which prohibited any and all abortions with up to three years of imprisonment. When Dick Lamb was elected to the Colorado House in 1966, birth control and abortion were not widely considered human rights, but crimes and abortion care was illegal all across Colorado and the country. In 1967, the 32-year-old who'd only been in Colorado for about five years, was still new to the house, worked with a civil rights activist and a Planned Parenthood board chair, Ruth Steele, and State Senator John Birmingham. And together they passed the first bill in the country to liberalize access to abortion care, the first. Their landmark bill opened the door to recognize abortion as a fundamental right. Perhaps his marriage to Dottie helped him understand the importance of bodily autonomy for women and the need to change the status quo. But we know this about Dick Lamb. His values were clear, he followed his beliefs with actions, and even when it wasn't popular, he stuck to his principles, spoke out, and led change. These traits certainly contributed to him being willing to push to liberalize Colorado's abortion laws, even as he stated, this will end my political career, but I just can't not fight for what I believe in. In running his landmark bill, Dick Lamb, the advocate, set aside concern for his own future in elected office, and as so often throughout his career, took the position he believed was right, no matter what. Representative Lamb's bill, with a Republican Senate sponsor, passed with bipartisan support, and Republican Governor John Love signed it into law. Thus, Dick Lamb's legacy is that today, at least here in Colorado, the decision when and whether to have a child is considered a human right. By 1970, only 13 states had followed Colorado's lead and passed their own reforms. Fortunately, times changed, progress was made, and Roe v. Wade became the law of the land in 1973, nearly 50 years ago. And times kept changing. Roe v. Wade made Lamb's Law ultimately unenforceable, yet portions of it remained in place until 2013. Dick Lamb also changed with the times. He supported the Colorado Medical Society and other forward-thinking organizations in their successful effort to have the restrictions in his bill declared unconstitutional in light of the Roe v. Wade decision. He watched approvingly as his old law was removed from the books, including the doctor-only provision. Like Lamb's bill, the 2013 update passed with bipartisan support. Today, abortion care can be provided by advanced practice nurses, making access to this safe, common health care available to patients all across Colorado. No longer does a patient on the Western Slope have to drive over two mountain passes to receive safe, quality abortion care. Unfortunately, this is not true in most of the states around Colorado. In our region, only Colorado and our southern neighbor, New Mexico, are supportive of meaningful access to abortion. And many patients from neighboring states travel up to 12 hours to receive care here in Colorado. Dick Lamb started the liberalization of abortion law. Colorado voters and legislators, time after time, have followed his lead. Access to abortion is safe in Colorado for now, even as the U.S. Supreme Court does what they are likely to do and reverse Roe. When this happens, even more patients from across the country will benefit from Dick Lamb's vision and advocacy. 
turning Colorado into a safe, legal, high quality abortion care haven, as long as we continue to follow Dick Lamb's lead. It is our friend Dick Lamb's legacy that Colorado remains a haven in the Mountain West for patients to find the care they want, they need, and they have a fundamental human right to obtain. Patients from across the country benefit from Dick Lamb's belief in and advocacy for bodily autonomy and the right to make our own healthcare decisions. His visionary courage to risk his political career and carry his idea forward made this a reality for patients across and beyond Colorado. Thank you. Thank you. 
moon River wider than a mile Crossing unit style Someday a you dream Maker you heart Breaker wherever you're going It was one thing to serve in his government, another thing to do politics with him. But the highest honor was to teach with him over 30 classes across 25 years. He was always so stunned and appreciative of the quality of the students that he had and the classes that we did with them. I remember once we were teaching for Ollie, the lifelong learning group, and so many of you are here today. We pulled up to a church on the east side of Denver. There were easily 100 cars in the parking lot. There were 200 people in the sanctuary. He said, I can't believe it. And I said, they heard I was coming. <laughs> he was an amazing teacher because he loved and engaged with his students. I wish all of them could hear the respect he would show them. Two of his students are here today, a student and mentee of Dick Lamb and co-founder of Effect.org, Uriel Barham. Thank you, Bowie, and uh, hello, everyone. My name is Uriel Barham, and I am a student of Richard Lamb. I, uh, of course, I want to begin by extending my deep condolences to Mrs. Lamb, Heather, Scott, and uh, the rest of the Lamb family. It's a particular honor for me to be speaking here today, uh, knowing the number of students that Richard Lamb taught over the years. Society is shaped by bold and unconventional methods. Governor Lamb and I connected because, like him, I grew up with no playbook for success. In 1987, the last year that he was governor, uh, I was not even born yet. My mother had only recently begun her immigrant story, having arrived in Denver from rural Mexico, embarking on a new journey into a new culture. It wouldn't be for another 25 years that Governor Lamb's path would cross with mine. Him being in his late 70s and me barely entering my 20s. Back then I was young and impressionable and I thought when I found out that I had a chance to study under a former governor, you know, this is someone that I could really learn a lot from. And as you could imagine, with a name like Uriel, our first encounter was maybe a bit awkward. He candidly mispronounced my name and I was too shy to correct him, but we clicked instantly. 
I was drawn to his limitless attitude in life. Throughout college, our relationship deepened, but it was not until I was a young alum that he left a lasting impression in my life. One year out of college into my first job, I sat down with him and he asked me one question that changed everything. He said, will you will have made an impact in society if you have your boss's job in 10 years? You know, that question pretty much put things into perspective for me and elevated my own truth. Not long after that conversation, as you could imagine, I left my job and now have the privilege of leading an organization that tackles some of the most pressing issues in our community. Thanks to the spark ignited by my relationship with him. But it was not until I left college that I fully understood the magnitude of the man, that he was the most controversial figure in the state well before he was governor, that he led the charge on sweeping policy reform and influenced the lives of millions. But in my life, to me, first he was my teacher. And a teacher must be devoted to the truth. And a practitioner must ensure that the truth is spread across the community. And Richard Lamb's life was a lesson in authenticity. He taught us that bold and unconventional methods shape society. And in good faith, he boldly shaped our own. Reinvesting his wisdom into the next generation of leaders to ensure that one day they may do the same. What I know is that Richard Lamb was a new man, a person with no roadmap to the heights he achieved. As we reflect on the life of Richard Lamb, I challenge all of us to find ways to the benefit of ourselves and the world. I leave you with the greatest lesson that I inherited from my professor, Richard Lamb. And that is, the only way to predict the future is to design it. Thank you. Another student, Colorado attorney, and she didn't put enough down person in legal education. I sat down in Governor Lamb's class. I was an 18 year old with an for hard choices in public policy that you could take a class as a college governor who's widely known to have even though I signed up for the class being in Governor Lamb's class just after a few I had declared a major in public policy thesis advisor when I completed my I think most students who enrolled that they were memorable. It wasn't a seminar or that he had a really slide with yellow font. <laughs> what stuck with you was to tackle difficult issues with Governor Lamb changed the course that he approached the kinds of conversations for most other people. And I really appreciated how it seems safe to assume that that to make trouble. But Governor Lamb guide people. He was always where his students could talk openly about and they could compassionately and curiously people they disagreed with. By the way, he engaged with the students who challenged the possibility that even his strongly held never condescended to students he disagreed with. I finished my public policy degrees. I had 
academic with an impressive career behind many 20-year-olds who offered their I can picture a desk pulled into a circle of students in giving a quiet pause before remarking point or that's true that a lot but I've never encountered another considered student perspectives complexity of tough questions the way that governor an attorney and over the two years I faced my fair share of tough I think often of the way with with conviction and a sincere desire to learn from and I strive to do the same. attorney, a Colorado author, Bruce Ducker. Hello. Uh, I have an idea for a book. This may not be the appropriate place, but it's a terrific idea. And I can't resist trying it out on you. Dick Lamb was a fellow writer, so I'm sure he wouldn't mind a brief commercial interlude. H here it is. You're at a garage sale, and you find this brass oil lamp. And you take it home, and you, as you're cleaning it, and you start to polish it, a genie appears. A bona fide, card-carrying, nose ring and all genie. And he offers you a choice between two wands, two magic wands. I can see some of you like it already. Anyway, two wands. And you have to choose only one. With the first wand, if you wave it and you say the magic words, all of the ills of the world disappear. The environment is reborn. Green is the seventh day of creation. The hatred between tribe and tribe, nation and nation, race and race, you and your neighbor vanishes. Video games and Billie Eilish take up Chopin and Emmanuel Kant. With the second same wave, every person's character is magically converted to the character, the moral bold lamb. Make a hasty choice. Be that character wasn't perfect, uh, despite Dick Lamb was merely a human being. For one thing, he could be a The Vandenbergs, the Lambs, and the Duckers. One evening, Dick pulled me aside. He'd been worrying. Dick, you may know, worried a lot. It gave rise to uh, suffering from insomnia. Bruce, he said, I do. All of our savings are in a single account at Shearson. How do you know the money? How do I know the money is there? How do I know there's anything? I said, well, Dick, you, you, get, a, a, you get monthly statements. You can check. He said, he said, they could just print those, couldn't they? What if it's just a con? So I explained the Protection Act and the Securities Investor. And of course, Dick knew all about it, and he knew it's a limit. So I explained the, about the financial industries. I described the security, which is an oversight board. 
you may have heard of, name Over the years, Jaron with a lot of provocative thoughts. That day, I left with a severe case of insomnia. So before you choose the second wand, bear that in mind, and I've only just started. Dick could be a chronic realist. Every argument he approached, not with conviction, but with curiosity, every argument he turned over on every side to see its pros and cons, regardless of who had proposed it. He'd argue about the need to spend more on education, expand our security, repair roads and bridges, extend benefits, and he'd get all huffy and realistic. Where's it gonna come from? Who's gonna pay for it? How are they gonna pay when a chunk of our population is already impoverished, when many feel overtaxed as it is, when we're leaving our children with a burden of debt that will diminish and not increase the ability to pay for their future. It could be irritatingly realistic. And another thing, he could be a chronic optimist. I mean, just look at his life. Look at, how, look at that dash that Wellington mentioned between the birth and the death. Look what he took on as a politician. Women's rights, race issues, immigration reform, comprehensive land planning, protection of wilderness, the quality of our stream flows, uh, water quality uh, standards, a record expansion of the state park system, growth planning at the county level. You have to be a really optimistic person to think of this. Then after decades of po in politics, this chronic optimist spends decades trying to teach adolescents. It's not widely known, but for that very job, the university originally approached Sisyphus. And he preferred to stay where he was. He thought there was better career opportunity, and he turned it down flat. To be an optimist is to be a lover. And as Groucho says, vice versa. Dick loved his family, his friends, and his country. And by his country, I mean it all. The people, the land, the mechanics, the system of the laws, the Bill of Rights, the rainbow's end, the dream at the rainbow's end. Not only the streamlining and the horsepower, but the transmission and the sludge in the oil pan. I think his friends Whether his country will remains to be seen. Two wands, use the first, and you get serenity for about a week and a half before we all revert to our own all-too-human mean. I told Dick's publisher, Bob Barron, about this great idea, and I told Dottie about it. They said they'd sue. I was driving along going to a hospital to visit my daughter and I got a call from my friend Marjorie Sewell that Dick Lamb was gone. I happened to be just a block away from their house. I should not have done, Dottie, what I did. I drove to their house and tapped on the window next to the front door, as I'd done many times before. And I received the most honorable introduction of my life. Heather Lamb's face appeared around the corner, and she said, oh, it's all right, it's just Bowie, Heather Lamb.
Most people called you governor or just sir. We called you dad, but we also called you bat, heir, papa bear, grandpa. The names we called you were as numerous, quirky, and varied as the roles you played in our lives. Names as strong and lasting as the values you imparted to us. Names that still echo in the air around us. First you were dad to Scott and then to Scott and Heather, the dad who loved us unconditionally. The dad who read to us, who asked us and everyone we knew, what are you reading? Who probably ascended to the pearly gates only to immediately inquire of St. Peter what he had been reading over the summer. The dad who taught us to ski, to climb, to raft, to explore, to travel. The dad who was home for family dinner five nights a week at 6.15 sharp, despite your insane schedule. And despite you were late. You were the dad who played endless games of ba 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 bum the dad who, when we were just four and seven years old, let us freely roam the grounds of the governor's mansion. The dad who didn't bat an eye when we decided that the indoor fountain was a swimming pool or the basement a hockey rink. But also the dad who wisely asked the mansion manager that anything of real value be placed in two rooms, then declared the no-no rooms where we were not allowed. Teaching us to explore, to be joyful, but to do it with boundaries and with respect. You were the dad who protected us, but also from the unwanted press and from the occasionally unforgiving stare of the public eye. You were the dad guided by an amazing childhood to be just that, a child had little room for children. You were the dad who neighborhood haunted house who at Maury Middle School one summer. The hospital with breast cancer at J.C. Penney. Here to you always. I confess. I'm still. You were the dad who wanted us. When I burst in the door one day, happening at the mansion, laughed when I marched up to the guest of honor in my. And I stuck out my arm to shake. Sand. day, month after month, gently picked up and returned and guinea pigs who would escape their room. You were the days where you and mom read Shakespeare, the sutras and Shel Silverstein and bickering of your kids. Not in vain though, dad. history of adventure. You feared for us. You showed us how to use an ice pick and I am told you were never more and in the spirit of adventure discovering only as the aircraft took but who crashed into the Andes. Be yourself, explore, be curious, show respect. As we grew into adults, we argued over issues. We called you for advice when we were arguing with others. We learned from you to try to see the other side of an argument, to listen to all viewpoints with an open mind, to find the good intentions under the hard words. You clipped articles by the dozens and sent them to us wherever we lived for years and years, including last summer. 
Soon you were the father to adult children and then the father-in-law to our spouses. Scott's wife, Cindy, bemused and a little shocked to be grilled about Wuthering Heights. My husband, Alex, with whom you debated policy, poetry, and economics in between sets of sit-ups at the gym. We traveled together as adults to Costa Rica, Alaska, Bonaire, Iceland, marveling at your energy, your ability to get absolutely anyone you encountered to reveal themselves in a story, and your ability to nap pretty much anywhere, anytime. You could recite a Frost poem from memory, only to then walk into the bar and flawlessly order a Michelob. <laughs> Adult children, challenge yourself and others, but listen deeply. Everyone has a story. Live a life of adventure. And soon, although not as soon as you would have liked, you were a grandfather, a papa bear, four times over. You held those kids on your lap every chance you got. You read to them constantly, sometimes the same book, dozens and dozens of times. Other times, you invented stories for them where they were the adventurer, the heroine, the explorer. Your love for your grandchildren meant you feared even more for your fellow man, for all of us. Predicted 14 of the last three global crises. Our when you delivered each household six full boxes in 2011, <laughs> you were ahead of your time. You reveled in telling the ranging from warnings of climate change to a local woman killed by a bear or a young child who wandered off in the wilderness. And while sometimes of second graders or on Christmas morning was perhaps off, we knew it was out of your deep sense of responsibility that the world they inherit be a better place. And your fear never overshadowed the gift of adventure that you encouraged in all of us. You taught three of your four grandchildren to swim, often to the palpable distress of bystanders. You let these kids struggle and splash and finally emerge with their heads above the water with a deep satisfaction of new self-confidence. You played soccer goalie for hours while they took shot after shot after shot. You stood nearby where they climbed every neighborhood tree, higher and higher, encouraging them to reach for the sky. You skied, rafted, biked, and hiked with them, ingraining in them all a deep love of our state and of the natural world. You stood beside them as guide and as guardian as you encouraged each child to learn their unique self. You cared about the important things and you cared deeply. You showed us all how to be generous of spirit and of heart just a few weeks before you died, faced with a grandson who had just crashed mom's car, you rang your hands in concern for him, his feelings, not the car, and then to the stunned grandson who had barely finished his remorseful confession, you said, well, do you wanna borrow my car? It's right out front. Your grandkids learn from you that a good book can open new worlds and mend a torn heart. They laughed that you could read just about anywhere regardless of the chaos surrounding you. They learned that duct tape can fix pretty much anything. We all chuckled at the endless index cards scattered around your house where get milk and pick up dry cleaning was scribbled next to a quote from Edward Gibbons. Grandchildren, be generous of spirit and of heart. Work hard for what you want. Read. Learned from you as a father, a grandfather, a and from all of us, we will do our spirit. Thank you, Bat. Grandpa, Papa Bear.
She wrote a book about her life called Second Banana, but we knew she was the first lady, Dottie Lamb. Thank you, dignitaries. Thank you, family, of course, and friends. Thank you, musicians. You've put a real spirit into an already blessed spirit. Thank you. Um, now you get to hear the real story. <laughs> um, let me start at the beginning with the story of how Dick and I met. It was a cold winter night just 60 years ago from this coming Christmas season. Roommates and I were having a party in a small house rented from an elderly couple. A friend arrived with two uninvited male guests and I was annoyed as the house was filling up big time. But I graciously invited the man What's just two more, I thought. Well, Christmas and New Year's came and went. Then one afternoon in early January, the phone rang. Exhausted from a long flight, I answered in a dreary tone. Hello, is this Dottie? Yes, I'm Dick Lamb, the friend of Jan's who came to your holiday party, and I'm wondering if you would like to go out for a beer. Which one were you? <laughs> I'm the one who went to college with Jan and I just got out of Berkeley Law School. Hmm, I don't think so, not tonight. I'm just too tired. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna call you in a week and see if you'll go then. Okay, bye. So a week later, the phone rings. And as the voice says, Dick is, this is Dick Lamb, how about that beer? I glance at the clock and I realize that this is not only exactly a week to the day, but it is precisely four o'clock PM, the same time to the minute he had called before. <laughs> this guy is not only persistent, but punctual. Sounds interesting. Sure, I said, why not? Interesting, yes. That night when I opened the door, I saw a tall man in a dark coat with a his neck. Bright eyes in his left hand, he shook mine with his right. Hi, I'm Dick. There's a Shakespeare play on TV, he said. I thought we might drink this and watch it. Then, he said, I promised my landlady that I would come and watch her dance. And I thought maybe you'd want to go too. I don't remember which Shakespeare play it was, but I do remember the landlady's dance. I knew that Sid King's was a strip joint. <laughs> but Dick, who'd only been in Colorado a couple of months, did not. <laughs> he blanched when we walked in, but I signaled I was game. Shakespeare and Sid King's in one night. Yes, this guy was more than interesting. Well, romance and passion blossomed throughout that winter and spring, but not without some circling around and testing. Once riding up on the ski lift after a glorious powder run, Dick cleared his throat and declared authoritatively, well, that was fun, but he said, I'm really much more excited about mountain climbing. How about you? 
I said, well, I climbed two Grays and Tories last summer. How many of you climbed? That satisfied him. Well, that short courtship set the tone for our official journey, which began at our wedding on May 11, 1963. The persistence and the punctuality were both a model for me to emulate and the bane of my existence, especially the punctuality. Two minutes late, what's the big deal? Was a big deal. But a more important tone was set at that wedding. The minister quoted the prophet by Khalil Gibran on marriage. Sing and dance together and be joyous, but let each one of you be alone, even as the strings of a lute are alone, though they quiver with the same music. I think we tried to live up to that quote, which in the modern vernacular simply would say, join in many endeavors together, but give each other some space. He gave me space when he never censored a column I wrote. I gave him space when I never criticized his policy ideas in public. He gave me space to run for the U.S. Senate, and I gave him space to run in a Reform Party presidential primary. Now, I don't mean this was a marriage made in heaven. It was not. It was based firmly on earth, and sometimes, like the two climbers of uh, uh, on a mountain of shale, like we sometimes were, and like Sisyphus, which somebody mentioned, we took two steps up and one back to reach the summit, or even an agreement halfway. But our marriage was rooted in Colorado soil. After all, we fell in love with the state before we fell in and though our travels sound like a chapter from Dr. Seuss, Oh, the Places You'll Go, Washington to Popocatapetl in Mexico, biking in places as far flung as Ireland and Vietnam, scuba diving from Cancun to Madagascar, visiting professorships from Innsbruck, Austria, to Christ Church, New Zealand, and to top it all off, a five-month semester at sea journey around the world with 500 college students. Hmm. Occasionally, when we had been gone a long time, someone would say to us, do you still live here? I thought you'd moved. No, no, never. For the projects we cared about, the work we still wanted to do was in Colorado, for Colorado, and with Coloradoans. Yes, our work had broader national, sometimes international implications, whether its purpose was championing women's rights and civil rights, fighting against global warming, or pushing for fiscal sanity and and our launch pads remained deep right here. They became even deeper when our two grown children, being gone about 10 years, came back here, married here, perfect grandchildren, all living less than 15 minutes from our home. Someone mentioned that Dick Lamb evolved, and, and he did. He changed over the years. He grew from a young, visionary legislator who sometimes made outrageous statements, some of you might remember, executive, to a brilliant and caring professor, to in his later years a rather philosophical poet. He not only read poetry, yes, he wrote poetry and belonged to a poetry group. <sighs> and
and more and more <coughs> concerned about people woes than policy woes. His eyes would well up when he saw children separated from their parents at the border. He worried, in fact, agonized weeks, months ago, over our translators in Afghanistan. What was going to happen to them? Why weren't they getting out? And what would happen to the women there when we left? And this was a long time ago. He also became more soft and sentimental. When bringing up our kids, his methods upon misbehavior, as nice as Heather said he was, was usually tough love and lectures. Ah, but with his grandkids, it became soft love and leniency. And he grew increasingly philosophical about death and dying. If someone died at our age or older, he would often, even someone we knew and cared about, he would often say, finally, well, he had a good run. But if a young person or a child ever died or even became seriously ill, he would become obsessed with grief and worry. Now, I've loved every stage of being Dick Lamb's partner in life. And thank you out there for giving me my credit for this, but it was my honor. But the time spent cocooning during the lockdown last winter, as awful, awful as the pandemic was, for so many people, for the world, and look at us, maybe still is. That was one of the richest times in our lives. We had time to review our lives, express love and appreciation for each other, watch silly television movies, read and talk about good books, and yes, think of where we would travel next. But sadly, that last part is not to be. So I say goodbye, love of my life. We had a really good run. Now pass your torch, release your spirit, raise your wings and fly over the Rockies. They say that he got crazy one 
hands and he tried to touch the sun 